Welcome to the Music and Entertainment Buzz. I'm Fred Capitelli, the host of this new e-show. And we have the legendary Greg T. Walker here with us today. And we're so proud to have you here, Greg. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> we have so many questions about your life. You have such an interesting life. And uh, I'd like to start out with uh, right from the beginning with telling you, asking you a question like, how, how was it growing up as an American? Well, I didn't grow up on a reservation, so um, I have a different set of circumstances. My parents had, you know, moved from the country eventually into the city. I'm the youngest of four children, so um, I grew up in pretty much regular old neighborhood America. But we spent summers, weekends, and holidays, you know, back over on the farm, as we called it. My uh, mother and father both grew up about eight miles apart, so I had both sets of grandparents. They're very close together. Yeah, I went to regular schools. Uh, I, I didn't have the reservation life, so it wasn't talked about a whole lot, to be honest with you. Okay. Was it, was it, was, was, did, did uh, like, when you were, with your childhood, was, uh, was, you had friends and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Were they interested in it? Were they ever inquisitive about it? Are you an American Indian? Did they ever get into that? No, because I'm Muskogee Creek from the eastern branch of the Florida Creek Nation. Um, you know, the stereotype is riding the horses across the plains and shooting <laughs> buffalo bows and arrows. We didn't have buffalo in the south. Yeah. Right. And, uh, yes, we used bow and arrow and all that. Yeah, but right. We had European contact, you know, 500 years ago. Right. And what we see in the movies was more recent when the horse culture moved from pretty much Mexico up into Texas and up through the Southwest and beyond, it's, it's typecast. And you think these um, you know, real dark-skinned um, feathers flying kind of thing. Yeah, know? right, right, right. We were a different culture. We were a woodland tribe, all the Southeastern tribes. So it's, it's a lot different. We had, since we had the contact so much early on, we went from buckskin to cloth, calico, and things like that much earlier than some of the others did that got contact from whites later on. So, no, it, you know, I didn't stand out it really any different. You know, I, I pretty much was homogenized and blended right in. Blend right into the American culture. Okay. Okay, now let's get into when you this, you found out and you just and you realized that you had the talent to be playing music. How old were you? And did you take lessons? What did you do? I, I did. Uh, <clears throat> about five and a half years old, I got um, or five something like that. I got a little ukulele, you know, a little blonde finished ukulele like that. And within a few days, I was picking out what made sense, you know, a little melody, you know, three or four notes, and then right, right. two-finger chord, and like, hmm. And uh, my mother, more than anyone, thought, hmm, maybe he's got something here. I began piano lessons at about five and a half, and um, then I started picking up guitar, you know, I'd learn one chord, then two, and then I finally got Three chords. Well, back then, three chords was a song, you know. And um, being the youngest of four, as I mentioned, my brother and sisters were were dating, you know, and I was still a kid. And uh, one of my brother-in-laws, still one of my brother-in-laws, uh, knew four or five chords. Taught me a couple <laughs> more, and yeah, then right. I started showing him things. Yeah. But by the time I was ten, I had my very first organized play for pay band yeah and um, and never looked back never stopped I mean it, and it was regular and we were very serious we were playing the burger joints and skating rinks and bowling alleys and you know the school cafeteria and the little you know fifth sixth grade talent shows and it just kept going and going and going and we were very very serious then about um, 11 or 12 the Beatles came out and I went to see them I think I was 13 years old in the Gator Bowl in Jacksonville, and I sat there with the girl that I had, it was five bucks a ticket, I mowed yards for weeks, you know, and <laughs> and I saw her at, uh, at a class reunion a couple of years ago, and she reminded me of something. I was sitting there, and I said, that's what I'm gonna be when I grow up. 
And she said, what? I said, that. You know, I mean, I'm going to be there when I grow up. And she said, well, you're already doing that. I said, yeah, but I'm going to be that. In the big league, as I was yeah, thinking. Right, right. Yeah. And she said, well, you're already in the band. You've been in the band, like, for three years already. And yeah. I said, well, true. But I said, that's what I'm going to be when I grow up. And, you know, I just really, I never look back. So out of out of everybody when you were younger, who was the main influence of you? Like who was really like oh, besides clearly yourself? the Beatles. The Beatles. Absolutely the Beatles. I mean anybody on anybody on a personal level. Anybody on a personal level? No, I I have to say I had you know, about the most wonderful parents on the planet and you know, a huge extended family. I had a very normal, happy, healthy childhood. So life was grand to me as a kid. I, I had a great childhood. I, I don't have any bad stories like, oh, you know, it was tough and we were hungry. You know, I right. had a very normal, happy, healthy childhood. Good. So what? all of my elders were influences as far as people. I understand. Of course, you know, you have the Yankees. Everybody liked the Yankees. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know there was another ball team. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so, you know, Mickey Mantle and Roger yeah. Maris and all those people. Yeah, right. I got to meet Roger Maris years later. And, right, right. Oh, just, you know, what a treat that was. Yeah, especially the Yankees. Uh, back then, I know I'm probably the same age as you are. Yeah. And that was the big thing back then. And other than the Beatles, uh, prior to that, because my brother and two sisters were older, I heard music all the time. You know, I grew up when it was Pat Boone and when Elvis came out and the Drifters and the Platters and that late 50s, early 60s. And I don't know that that was necessarily an influence, but it sure was embedded. Right, right. You know, right. It was, I was brainwashed. <laughs> but when the Beatles came out, it's like, and now I've got something to sink my teeth into. Did you ever, did you get, uh, when they first came here, they went to, they went to New York to the Shea Stadium. That was a big, big thing. Mm -hmm. Were you there at that? Or? Oh, no, no. No, you didn't get there to see that? No? no. It was many years later before I ever went out of the state of Florida. Yeah, so yeah. you were older. So, but, but that is the main influence. Well, I remember the event because it was so well publicized, yeah. just as uh, Ed Sullivan was. Yeah, Ed Sullivan, uh, the, the people from Ed Sullivan, from what I remember, because I remember the guy who used to uh, do all the, the staging for Ed Sullivan. Mm -hmm. I knew the guy personally, and at the time I was young like yourself, and uh, he was, happened to be my friend's father, and they're the one who did all that scaffolding for all those amplifiers in Chase Stadium. I've got part of that on a DVD that I, I bought a few years ago, and... It's just like I remember when I saw them. It was complete pandemonium. You couldn't hear anything. It was just a roar. It was just it was a happening. You didn't care. Yeah, you were the there. Screaming. Oh, oh the, yeah. The girls were out of their mind. You couldn't hear. You know, <laughs> they had little amplifiers. You know, just tall little box amps. Yeah. And, oh gosh. You know, yeah. sharing microphones. Yeah. You know, that kind yeah. Of thing. Yeah. 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 Well, well, uh, I know you play. You said you you start out with a ukulele and some guitar and piano. Uh, any other instruments you play? Yeah, I started saxophone lessons uh, seventh grade. I was twelve, and wound up playing first chair sax. By the time I got into probably ninth grade, on through high school, at one point I switched to drums in the school band because I didn't want to carry a saxophone. <laughs> the drumsticks were a lot cooler. Yeah, right. <laughs> the girls love drumsticks, and I went back to saxophone. I think the last year and. Uh, you know, eventually I went from the regular upright piano that I learned on. Yeah. I got a far piece of organ. Also drums, of course. Um, all of us that wound up in Blackfoot years later had played as kids. So we had all played guitar, drums, keyboards, and sang right. and everything else. Actually, bass guitar was the last thing I learned. Okay, and that's the, that's the instrument that you play that's with Glenn yeah. Skinner, right? Am I correct? It almost backfired on me because yeah. I... I formed the band Blackford. It was my idea to assemble childhood friends. We had all played together, but never all of us at the same time in one band. There's always two or three of us. Yeah. And I thought I was going to play drums, and so I'd get this thing all put together, and the drummer who used to play bass when I was playing keyboards was yeah. going to play drums, and I said, well, so what am I going to play? And they said, well, play bass. <laughs> I said, well, I, I've never played bass. And they said, that's the only thing you've never played. It's about time you learned that. And I went, good point. <laughs> so I became a bass player on the spot. And you played for Lennon Skinner, am I um, correct? I did. Um, 
after Blackfoot formed, which was September of 69. Yeah. The end of 71, I joined Leonard Skinner. Uh, Blackfoot's had a couple of hiccups through the years. Young, youth, you know, just in each other's hair all the time. Right. Growing pains. And uh, two of us actually went down to help them record. They had lost a member. One of my guys went down first. I later joined and in a very short span of time recorded an awful lot of music that came out on various albums through the years. But not while we were in the band because I was with Skinner five minutes, as I say. Oh. Like, you know, 20-something others. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but I did a lot of recording. After six months, I, I told the other guy, my bandmate, that I wanted to get the other guys, put Blackfoot back together. We had helped our friends out, Leonard Skinner, who was the one percent, as everybody knows, of the early band. And our, our time was over, and I wanted to get it back. And I said, if you want to stay, fine. If you don't, if you want to come back, that's, that would be great. And he said, yeah, you know, I do. So we put Blackfoot back together and, for the most part, stayed together from then on until 1986. How did uh, how did uh, Ricky Medlock? How did he uh, how did he how did he get with you? Had uh, was he from Leonard Skinner originally? Am I correct? No, he and I are the two that uh, that joined Leonard Skinner. Oh, together you guys joined that together. Mm -hmm. Okay. He went a little bit ahead of me, and they had some trouble with their bass player. And uh, I always said, if if something happens, give me a call. Give me 24 hours. So. Yeah. I had gone back up north, but, you know, the band had moved to New York in 1970, and I went back up there because I had more friends there than I did in Florida since I'd left high school, and he called me one Thursday, and he said, if you want the, uh, you want the gig, it's yours, and I said, I'll be there tomorrow afternoon, so the next day I jumped on a plane, and back then you could fly, you know, big cabinets and all, and yeah. there I was. Yeah, right. <laughs> but Ricky and... Jackson, our, our drummer, the three of us are the ones that had grown up since kindergarten, just before kindergarten. We were friends, and we were, I don't know, four years old, I think. And okay. About as early as I remember life, those two guys were well, part of my part of your life. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and he was with Blackfoot, am I correct? Is he, he, was, he started Blackfoot with you, or he? Uh, Ricky Medlock and yeah. Jackson Spires and I with Charlie Hargrit, who's still with us, you know, even today. Yeah. Now, Jackson knew Charlie. I had not met him until they brought him in. Um, I actually, Charlie and Ricky and I had a band a few months prior to Blackfoot. That's when I had met Charlie. And when he came into audition, he played Badge by Cream. And when he did that middle guitar yeah. section, we're like, oh, you got the job. Yeah. <laughs> you can play I mean, that, that, right? That's, that's all we need to hear. I mean, you know. <laughs> that was, yeah, it was good. Oh, yeah. yeah. So how would you come up uh, getting to your band, your Black Blackfoot? How'd you come up with that name, Blackfoot? I mean, why, why did you come up with that out of all uh, the names? Jackson Spires and I, you know, being of native descent, wanted something to do with our heritage, but we didn't want to be too blatant. Of course, that got thrown out the window. <laughs> uh, as mentioned, I'm Muscogee Creek. He was Cheyenne and Cherokee. And uh, so none of our tribal names sounded like a band name. And one night watching Johnny Cash in New York City in uh, 1970 on his variety show. He always had about a five or ten minute segment to honor Native Americans. Very cool and I think back on it. And we're sitting there and Jackson said, Blackfoot. And we went, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. We were called Hammer. We got to New York from Florida. We found out a band on the West Coast had a new album out but under the name Hammer. So we changed the name to free. All Right Now came out two weeks later. And so we were at that moment when we had to change the band's name yet one more time. And when Jackson said Blackfoot, we're like, yeah, that's that's bold, you know, Blackfoot. Yeah, right. Sounded better than Creek. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it's got like a tough, yeah, solid it's, it's sound. It's a bold, bold sound. Yeah, name. solid sound. Okay. So nobody in the band was Blackfoot, you know. It's, Misconception there. Right, right. Wait, well, now let's get into writing your songs. I know you write. You're you're a composer. Um, can you tell the audience uh, 
what, what procedure do you use? Do you first write the words? Do you first write the music? Or the, how do you do it? Or mm-hmm. every song is different? And how do you come up? With, how do you come up with the ideas for the song? I promise. I was just having this conversation with a friend of mine on the phone this morning. Um, I was thinking about some lyrics in a songbook I have, and I've done it both ways. As only a couple of magic moments in my life as a writer. Uh, I was sitting on a plane on a runway of Newark Airport one time, and this idea came in my head. I mean, it's tired. Just came back from Europe, I think it was, and I'm thinking. Um, it's the first two lines that just came to my head, and the song just came out of nowhere. And it was, um, you know, on the runway again, touchdown. I don't know when I've been this tired kind of thing. And I wrote that whole song. I was flying into Jacksonville to get my truck to drive 100 miles to my cabin, and I got to my sister's house, and I walked in, and I sat down and played it on an upright piano. It was all in my head, words and everything. But that's only one other time I wrote when my father died. I had a, I kind of woke up out of a half sleep one night and, and thought, uh, yeah, it's been 10 days since my father died. It's been 10 days since I last cried. And I grabbed a pencil and a notepad, and it's like somebody took my hand and just moved it. Wow. And I got up the next morning. I had thumbtacked it to the wall, and I thought, I wrote that? Wow, yeah, I'm pretty proud of that. But ordinarily, for me, it's usually been music first, a melody, a chord progression. So I've got a lot of those that to this day I haven't put words to, and I've got a book full of lyrics I never put music to. Yeah. Um, Jackson and Ricky wrote the overwhelming majority of all the songs that we recorded throughout the career of Blackfoot. and. It was me.